Hello and uh, welcome to Mineral from the Marshes, the story of coastal salt making in Lincolnshire. Well, as you can see, salt is known to have been made in the county for the best part of three millennia, uh, from the Bronze Age uh, right up until the early 1600s AD. And evidence includes hundreds of sites found during field walking as part of the English heritage funded Fenland project. And that was back in the 1980s. During that long period of salt making, Lincolnshire benefited from having the ideal coastline of long tidal creeks, which uh, pierced the wide salt marshes. It had nearby supplies of fuel, in this case peat, and clay to make the bricotage, the ceramic material used in the process. Now, before we talk about the archaeology, let's just think for a moment about the product itself and the qualities of it, the qualities of salt. Uh, every animal, including humans, needs salt. Our bodies can't live without it. We need it for maintaining the fluid in our blood cells, uh, to maintain our neuromuscular functions, and that's amongst many, many other uses in our bodies. We cannot live without it. Uh, we see here it talks about a profound symbolic significance. So uh, what does that mean? And uh, let's think about that as we go on. Well, as we can see here, uh, this is November the 4th, 2006, but 2006 AD, uh, pagans were pelted with salt and branded witches. And, uh, and the owner of a pagan shop said, uh, we've had salt thrown in our faces. And salt is not just uh, important in one country or one part of the world. You can see from all over the world here, salt is uh, important in Finland there, salt in Finnish mythology and folklore, uh, in the Caribbean underneath it, the Yala Ponds. Um, in the middle at the bottom, there's a um, salt festival in Spain. Uh, the sumo wrestler is uh, presenting salt to his god ahead of his bout. And uh, yeah, there's a bit about zombies and witches as well. So uh, what made salt this magic mineral? Why did it become white gold? Why was it sought after? And uh, why was it used so extensively in, in folklore? Well, at one point in uh, prehistory, and no one really knows when, the application of salt to the, uh, the organic material uh, was found to inhibit the growth uh, of bacteria and mould. Uh, basically, it stopped the rot. It preserved things. It stopped flesh rotting and going off. And so it was a preservative and a purifier. And uh, it, it just meant that meat and fish could be kept over winter, um, year round, including bad years. You could plan ahead. Uh, basically, it was a miracle product. Yeah, not only that, but salt could be used for many, many other purposes as it is today. But for prehistoric people, um, these are just some of them. Food seasoning was probably the least important of the lot, but preservative there is important. It was also interestingly used um, as antiseptic and medicine. It was used in trade. Everyone needed it. So um, it was just a key product. So as it says here, um, up to the Neolithic period, people hunter-gatherers, salt was present in their diet, including from meat and fish. Um, but a change in lifestyle, a change uh, to farming, uh, brought about the need for additional salt intake.
Now the map on the left is a distribution of sultans in the Lincolnshire Fens with the Bronze Age and early Middle Iron Age sites at the southwest and then a movement out onto the marshes in the Late Iron Age and Roman periods. And as you can see, these are a long way inland from the modern coast. Um, on the right is a LIDAR image of the area. Uh, it's in effect, I guess, a micro topographical map of the Fenland, showing the extent of all the past tidal creeks and rivers through time. Uh, the green areas around the coast is later siltland, and that's mainly from post-Roman marine flooding. And it is higher than the blue colours further inland. And we know that there are some uh, Roman sultans and settlements buried by those later silts underneath the green. Uh, but it's impossible to know how many and how far they extend. Well, this is a typical Fenland arable field and we field walked thousands of these. Uh, we walked up and down in 30 metre transects, ideally when the field was ploughed and weathered. Uh, the Sultan sites were usually about 25 to 30 metres in diameter and they often looked black and red, uh, the red from the dense uh, amounts of broken bricotage fragments and some of these uh, some of these fields had several of these sites in them. Now we're going to uh, look at uh, uh, some bricotage the uh, the image top left shows what field walked bricotage looked like um, except that there is usually hundreds and hundreds of these uh, bricotage fragments on the field surface uh, in the Fenland they are containers that are, are broken as pedestals hards and clips and uh, you can see uh, get a, an idea from the rest of them what they looked like when they were complete. The, the top left is mostly um, containers. In the centre you can see our early attempts at uh, trying to um, understand the containers and the shapes and we we still believe that the one on the left is okay. Um, these were named gutter shaped troughs and these belong to the Middle Iron Age and possibly a little bit earlier too. Um, the other two we're less certain of now, partly because of the discovery of the containers at the bottom left, and we'll talk about those more later on. Um, on the right of the image are examples of pedestals on which the containers stood in the, the hearths and the ovens and the clips that held them together on those hearths and ovens. And uh, this shows how we think the gutter shaped troughs were made and the distinctive types of pedestals on which they stood in the hearth and see uh, bottom left for a kind of reconstruction drawing of that. Now the lighter coloured containers at the back of the image on the left are about the most intact ones that have been found. Um, they were discovered on Ingemel's Beach just north of Skegness in 1980 after a storm had washed the sand off the beach. Um, they are narrower and shallower at one end, wider and deeper at the other. And uh, you can see that from the illustrations. And there's also a reconstruction in plan of how they may have been clipped together on the hearth. And uh, the majority of hearths that have been found, which are, of course, you know, quite few, there's been very few excavations, um, they have been found to be rectangular. Uh, the hearth on the right is uh, da damaged by animal burrows, um, but yielded an Iron Age radiocarbon date from the charcoal, a, a date of around about 180 to 90 BC. And on the left, uh, as we look, uh, it's what we term a settling tank. These are first seen in the very latest part of the Iron Age and into the Roman periods. They're clay lined. Uh, they've got two, sometimes three compartments and are situated adjacent to the hearths. And we assume that the brine 
from the creek or from the natural pools in the marsh, which are also confusingly called pans, um, we assume the brine is bucketed into the compartments of the tank um, where the, it's allowed to settle with the silts and sands that are held in suspension being allowed to drop out. And then the clean brine is then bucketed into the containers for boiling. Um, often the am animal damage is extensive, as at this site in Helpringham, dated to the second century BC, and you can see damaged hearths and a slight mound of mainly ashy burnt material. This hearth at Spalding is late Iron Age, early Roman. The adjacent settling tanks, they yielded radiocarbon dates of between 170 BC and AD 140. But a different date was forthcoming, uh, the archaeomagnetic date from the hearth, the last firing of which was 130 to 270 AD. Um, however, the hearth seems to have been reused after the end of salt making and quite a lot of hammer scale was found in the vicinity. At uh, Chatteris in Cambridgeshire, this hearth or oven dates from the late Iron Age or early Roman period. You can see they're all quite different. Um, also at Chatteris in the very clay soils, this pit has a reasonably intact container. Um, I know it's broken in many pieces, but uh, much of it can be seen and put together again. So it is a typical rectangular shape, um, as we saw with the containers earlier on. And finally, in this little section, bricotage uh, from a surface site. It was material collected by the farmer and given to us during the field walking. And the big pedestal on the right is classified by Elaine Morris, who did all the uh, analysis of the bricotage as uh, PD4 and uh, pedestal typical of the Middle Iron Age date. And the remainder is chiefly container fragments. This is the site of a gravel quarry extension at Deep in St. James. The image top right has at the very top, uh, you can see the River Welland, which is the county boundary between Lincolnshire and Cambridgeshire. And top left, you can see the dark spread. Uh, it's an intact prehistoric soil buried by up to half a metre of river alluvium sometime in the early to middle part of the Iron Age. And the yellow strip that you can see is a bank adjacent to a canalised stream course, which may have brought salt water to the site. We tried to plot the finds, uh, sort of field walking on a prehistoric land surface, uh, but after we reached about 9,000 finds, which was mainly pottery and bricotage, we had to abandon that. And uh, when we finally stripped that off, underneath lay post holes of round buildings, four post structures and a few halves, the latest dated to around about 600 BC. Uh, sadly, there was nothing that we could definitely say it was associated with salt making. Um, near the canalised stream course, there was a lot of burnt pebbles, which may have been used to heat tidal water and crystallise salt, uh, but there was no proof of that one way or the other. Uh, if you see the pit bottom right, that was the, the best proof we had with some very ashy layers. And you can see, and those ashy layers contained bricotage along with um, some Deverell Rimbury style pottery from the middle to later part of the Bronze Age. Um, very few of these Salton sites have been excavated, but here are a few site plans. Uh, you can see a, a common feature on, uh, on a number of them are the penannular ditches. Now, a functionalist would say that these are for drainage to capture some of the water that would inevitably be slopping around. But there is also the possibility that they were exclusion zones, keeping out anyone who does not have that special gift of turning the ocean into this valuable magic wonder product. And you can see at the top, 
uh, that the middle to later Iron Age sites don't have the settling tanks, but those of the late Iron Age, early Roman, they do. And uh, where they are uh, there, they're situated pretty much adjacent to the hearths. And we'll have a look at uh, a reconstruction of the uh, second century AD site at Morton, which is center left here. We'll, uh, we'll have a look at that in a moment. Uh, as you can see, this is uh, a different character to the other sites. There are no circular ditches uh, and it resembles in plan only one other site that I know about, uh, a site somewhere in Norfolk. Um, someone once said that salt was probably made um, just by some shepherdess in her spare time when she was looking after sheep on the marsh. But um, this aims to refute this just by the sheer amount of people um, involved and what we now would call supply chains. Um, the image shows people digging the clay to make the containers and the bricotage, people tending the hearths, and from our experimental work with Andrew Fielding, we know that once the hearth starts up, there is a need to be moving the crystallizing brine from container to container with the nearest one uh, to the actual heat, unsurprisingly crystallizing the salt first. Uh, but we can also see here there are peat diggers and people transporting the peat to the site and the salt away from the site. So overall, quite a few people involved and presumably for much of the summer season. Now, an aerial photograph of the Morton area on the Lincolnshire Fen uh, with lots to see. Uh, you can't see the Morton Salton site or any of the others that are on this photo. At the top, uh, you can see a winding natural creek with a straight watercourse leaving that and heading off the image to the centre left with a farmhouse and yard on top of it. That straight watercourse is the Bourne Morton Canal and that is of early Roman date. Um, the image has north at the top. Uh, the field to the north of the farmhouse has some linear light marks, as do the fields southeast of the farm and towards the bottom centre of the photo. These are peat cuttings. They were probably originally somewhere around two or three metres deep. And on the right hand side of the photograph, you can see that has lighter, siltier soils, and that's due to late or post Roman marine flooding. Uh, the left of the photo is darker and that was formerly peat and the linear peat cuttings, they were flooded by this late um, or post-Roman incursion which deposited silt in the bases of the peat cuttings and subsequently the peat has been drained so these light linear marks, the former peat cuttings, are now made up of slight ridges of silt um, and that outlines the former cuttings there. So in the centre left, um, the Bourne Morton Canal cut some of these silty bands, suggesting it postdates them, which of course means that there was an earlier flooding episode as well. And to the southeast are more silty bands, which probably relate to the late and post-Roman flooding, and they were no doubt associated with the early Roman salt making. And the cut peat, uh, wherever it was from, um, almost certainly fired those halves and ovens at the salt making sites. There are also peat cuttings known along the Fen Causeway in Norfolk and uh, Rog Palmer spent a bit of time trying to work out how much peat might have been extracted from these and you can see that uh, uh, there is an awful lot of uh, person hours involved in cutting that amount of peat. Um, this is a LIDAR image showing the complexity of the landscape with multiple creeks from marine incursions and the distribution of Iron Age, which are the yellow um, dots, the, the Roman sites. Um, they all lie around the low-lying peaty areas. Um, and that is the white on the, the bottom left. That is the low ground where the peat has now shrunk. Um, the green on the right is pretty well all post-Roman and medieval flooding. And uh, there'll be more LIDAR 
um, images a little bit later on. The, uh, the image now, the map, shows the distribution of the late Iron Age and Roman sites in the Fenland, but we are now going to have a look at the area on the top right of the map, uh, the coastal sites, which are again of that same period, mainly late Iron Age and early Roman. Um, this shows a map by Alistair Strang, um, and that uh, is of the surveying information gathered by Ptolemy, and uh, it took place before 122 AD, and so Alistair Strang has, has worked on that, um, and this is his map. Um, it shows the coast, of course, and in the centre, in uh, you can see the larger letters uh, with the word Albion and just below that on the coast and fitting in well with the distri distribution of the known sites in the same place is the place name Selenae, the place of the salt makers. Yeah, when John Leyland uh, visited Skegness in the early 1500s, he was told um, that it was once a great haven town, um, a walled town with a castle, castell, uh, but the old town is clean, consumed and eaten up with the sea and at low waters, <coughs> excuse me, uh, appear manifest tokens of old buildings. So it indicated it was once a large town um, a wall town, and uh, there's no medieval or documentary evidence of a wall town or a castle um, in the area. Um, there is, though, uh, much of Skegness, as it says there, was under the um, jurisdiction of Ingemel's Manor, and uh, the mention of place names Chesterland and Castelland, which sound uh, extremely Roman. So the question is, was this Selenae? This is um, a LIDAR image. Um, it's the distribution of known sites uh, pretty much tying in with the location of Selenae. Uh, you can see there are quite a few here in straight lines, and this is because all the sites are buried by up to about two meters of post-Roman silting and therefore the only way we know about them is uh, when the excavation takes place such as dike cutting or where the pipelines come ashore or where there's a new road uh, and it's then if only there is an archaeologist to hand and just incidentally right at the bottom left hand corner you can see an area of white which is the start of a larger area of former peat fen which we could argue um, served all those sultans in the Selenae area. Um, this is what a site looks like um, on the beach were also sites found on the beach, uh, particularly after storms, which tend to remove the sands uh, or in particular high tides. Um, this photo was taken in the 1980s at Ingemel's Beach and shows a typical sultan. And what you can see are the remains of containers, hards and pedestals. And uh, so it's actually quite similar to what the sites look like um, when you field walk in on the surface. This is what the Sultans look like in section two sites. Um, on the right, uh, it's the Adelthorpe Bypass, and on the left is a drainage dike also at Adelthorpe. And we can see clearly the depth of the post-Roman silting burying these, um, these early Roman sites. Um, we don't know where we are in terms of each site, whether this cuts through the centre of, of those little mounds or it just clips an edge, we don't know. But what we can't see is the circular ditches which surround the Fenland sites. Um, but we can see the heaps of um, ashy burnt material and the bricotage. And we believe these sites continue into what is, what is now offshore. And we know 
that um, some of this coast has been eroded and we know that bits of bricotage have been um, washed up and collected. Um, it's a map of the area of Adelthorpe and Ingermells, just north of Skegness. Uh, the area outlined in red on the map on the left uh, is a planning proposal for a fishing lake and caravan park. And the area was subject to geophysical survey and the results are there on the right. And you can see at least four anomalies. Um, these were buried sites, were hand augured and lots of bricotage fragments come up in the auger. So these were individual Salton sites. And if you just look back to the map on the left, um, project that density of sites across the rest of the map, and that would be one big distribution of Sultans. Another map on the left, it shows a complete guess at the Roman coastline and the possible location of Selenae and the wind turbines uh, off Skegness are probably close to the uh, site of the Roman town. Um, just a little thing about uh, salt place names. On the left, there's the, the continental ones, including the famous um, Hallstatt. Uh, but we just find it interesting that places in and around the Fens uh, with uh, plenty of Iron Age and uh, early Roman salt making tend to have these hail names and hull names as well. You can see on the, the right hand side um, the medieval names of uh, Frognall and Rippingale and the villages of Great Hale, Little Hale, Helpringham, Helsby all have got late Iron Age uh, early Roman sites in abundance and uh, I, I went down to Camel Drove in Littleport in Cambridgeshire. Somebody asked me if I'd go and have a look at a site in Camel Drove, and I thought, what a wonderful name. And uh, but and only later did I find out that it was the area um, where all these salt making sites were in Littleport was uh, called Cam Hale in the medieval period. So um, just a just a little interesting diversion. So what did happen between the third century AD and the Middle Saxon period? Uh, well, first of all, there were significant floods around the coast, not only the Lincolnshire coast, but the, the, the coast of Britain and in fact all around the North Sea. And it must have made things very difficult for, um, for the salt makers, uh, but salt somehow must have continued to be made. There are early references to salt making, the Middle Saxon references, quite a few of them along the south coast. Um, and in this one, um, uh, granted a parcel of land on the west bank of the river uh, for salt working. And interestingly, this one is for use in divine services and other daily religious uses. We, we mentioned very early on about um, salt and religious uses. And uh, we know that there was a new way of making salt, um, a method called sand washing. And we know that um, this was in operation by the late Saxon uh, period. We'd found late Saxon pottery on top of the mounds of um, waste uh, muds at Wrangell and Bicker. Um, but uh, recent work by Oxford Archaeology East at Kings Lynn in Norfolk has resulted in a Middle Saxon date being proved for um, the start of the method there. So it involved um, scraping the muddy foreshores uh, after the, uh, the salty fortnightly spring tides. This was then filtered um, in a system like that on the left and uh, the resultant brine was um, boiled in lead pans. Lead pans had in fact been used from the from the latest part of the um, the Roman period. And the interesting way, uh, the interesting thing about this new method 
is that it left behind um, mounds of this desalinated um, silt that they'd um, that they dragged up from the foreshore. So there are huge mounds that are visible still. Um, so we know pretty much exactly where these sites were. This is uh, Hilary Healy's map of Lincolnshire and it shows the locations of the Saxon and medieval sultans. Um, the little numbers are um, how many sultans were there were in, used in Doomsday and you can see the shaded areas. Um, for the Fenland, uh, we go back to Lidar, and in the southeast, you can see that clump of uh, yellow. And uh, these are the mounds of this desalinated silt, the waste heaps. Um, they're just outside the medieval sea bank, and coming west from that, you can see a line where the green colours are slightly different, and the line is the medieval sea bank and the slightly lighter green is seaward. And the line goes to some more of those mounds near to Spalding. And then there's another group um, to the north in Bickerhaven, which was a, a medieval arm of the sea. And right in the northeast is a line of several miles of mounds. And that's just seaward of that white patch, which we now know is former peat. This is what uh, the mounds look like on the ground. And if you look at the photo top left, believe me, they are massive. Um, they're massive mounds uh, in Fenland terms. And underneath that image is what they look like on the LIDAR. So you can see lots of um, individual mounds. Uh, the image is uh, the image on the right is of the top of Bickerhaven. And that's that arm of the sea that we talked about with a couple of fairly small streams coming into it. And the villages from bottom left are Donnington, Bicker and to the top right, Swineshead. And the early ones here are furthest from the sea and these show up as the, the lowest of the mounds. And gradually during the medieval period, the industry moved south along the haven towards the coast. Uh, very few of these mounds have undergone any excavation at all. This one in Bickerhaven in Quadring Parish, uh, Hilary Healy undertook this um, excavation in the 1960s. The farmer had hired a company to level some of the mounds and when the work was partially done, Hilary recorded remains of a hearth, um, of a peat stack, a small rectangular structure. Uh, which he identified by post holes and a few pits. So this collection of features was part um, uh, of the Sultan and it was dated to around about 1300 AD. Uh, it was interestingly part way down the mound, indicating that waste silt had continued to be dumped on that mound after these features had gone out of use. So you can see there the, the quite dramatic colours. And uh, as I say, this is a very, very rare um, excavation of these medieval sites. Um, this is an indication of the height of the mounds. Um, this work is at a place called Saracen's Head near Spalding, and it shows uh, levelling of the mounds. Um, and this was undertaken in 1939 and uh, it was part of the war effort. Uh, the lady um, standing there is a well-known Lincolnshire folklorist and archaeologist called Ethel Rudkin. And the section is interesting in that it doesn't appear to have any features within it, as far as we can see. Uh, but the planks along the bottom and the reasonably straight section do seem to indicate that some archaeological work was being carried out, um, but we don't know of uh, any results. Um, and interestingly, in Wheeler's book, A History of the Fens of South Lincolnshire, he includes a section on fen mounds and he noted that even in the 19th century, mounds were being levelled by farmers as um, they were uh, difficult to, to farm. 
Um, and now we come to pretty much to the end of the um, salt industry. There are um, the 1300s. They they were a kind of significant time for the salt making. Early on, everything was going fine. We were exporting salt all around Europe. Um, but then we um, we were suddenly taking in some uh, cheaper French imports. And of course, uh, the Black Death made the, the whole thing about the markets much more difficult. Uh, less salt was needed. Um, significant flooding. Uh, some occurred in the 1570s. Um, when, it's, as it says in Marsh Chapel, all the salt coats were utterly destroyed, but um, flooding had been a problem from the, um, well, from the 1200s really onwards. Um, there were cheap imports, um, as we said, first from the continent, um, and then Scotland and Newcastle, where they could make their own salt. They had coal, and so they had um, a, a huge amount of uh, material they could burn from source. Our, our only um, source was peat and the, the, those sources were diminishing rapidly. And so there was really a gradual decline um, until the early 1600s when uh, we, we stopped making the coastal salt. And, and it brings to a close our quick look at the history of salt making in Lincolnshire. Um, there's still very much detail to learn, um, but this is a, is a framework on which we can build um, a more detailed picture. And there are a number of publications available um, about the early salt making. Um, with this one, Mineral from the Marshes, I wanted to outline what we knew about each period in Lincolnshire. So um, it was readily available in one volume. So it's really the only publication in the county which looks at the whole three millennia of salt making. And uh, it's available from the Heritage Trust of Lincolnshire or from the Society of Lincolnshire History and Archaeology. And uh, that's about it. Thank you very, very much for listening.